because we're moving into some very strange times. And just in terms of awareness and its biblical relevance, we wanted to really propose into these things. And are we going, are, yeah, we're doing here? Good, okay. Many of you know, may know that some years ago that uh, we had uh, published some things in biotech and uh, calling it the Sorcerer's Apprentice. And uh, it's not caught up, there's a pillar there, I'm not seeing it. It's all there, it's right? All yeah, there. okay, yeah, sorry. I'm getting it. Yeah, gotcha. Oh, we're all set. Okay, good. Uh, many of you uh, know about, may, may remember The Saucer's Apprentice, you know, uh, that was written by Paul Dukas back in 19, uh, 1897. And it was featured in Walt Disney's famous movie, Fantasia. And it was based on a, on a, on a legend or a, a, a Goethe's actual story about a, a, a sorcerer's apprentice who, in the legend, uh, was tampering with the engines of creation. And uh, we issued this original story back uh, in 2001 and we updated it a few times. And one of the things I wanted to, to uh, do is update it here. And uh, so, here we, now the, the reason we call it the Sorcerer's Apprentice, the biotech, the Sorcerer's Apprentice, most of us may remember that old castle. Mickey was clad in a uh, sorcerer's robe and hat and uh, uh, they had psychedelic, uh, Armies of brooms and rentless march of Duca's symphony went on. And only when the castle was a flood and the sorcerer, did the sorcerer wake up because his student had done it improperly and he had to uh, 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 undo what he did. And of course, Mickey got off just with a uh, swat of the broom. But we may not get off as well because the sorcerer apprentice is unleashing things that people may not realize where they're going. And uh, it's interesting that technology is often a very close cousin of sorcery, even in the literature here. And uh, so, you know, many of the things we enjoy every day would look like sorcery to the, 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 the uh, people back then, flying through the air at the speed of sound and uh, communicating images with the speed of light and even landing on the moon. These are ideas we take for granted today, but I want to get that in perspective. And so we want to move on here a little bit. And uh, I'll get off all, we don't need to get in all the history here. But um, we're moving into what some people are calling the age of the hybrids, and I'll explain why. We're going to talk about one aspect of that, and that's the move towards transhumanism. What do we mean by that? And we're going to discover there are four technologies that are accelerating so fast it's amazing, and they're converging upon each other to create some changes that really are changing by the week, not by the year. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the challenges they present, but we'll also highlight some of the dangers that should not be overlooked. But we're going to touch on a, talk on another topic. It's a close cousin of that one. We're going to talk a little bit, not too much, relax, but we're going to talk a little bit about alien invasions. And uh, there are two kinds of people here in the world, those that think they're just a myth and uh, those who have done a little bit more homework and may surprise you. So uh, we'll, we'll go into that a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about the Nephilim. Everybody wants me to talk about Genesis 6. And it's astonishing to me, and you know, that how many people have come to the Lord through those peculiar, weird things we put out there years ago. Not only at Genesis 6, but also after that. And we'll try to explore a little bit what did Jesus mean when he said the day, uh, spoke of the days of Noah. As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What did he mean by that? And so we're going to surprise many here with the ex talk a little bit about the expectations of the Vatican. The Roman Catholic Church has a substantial investment in technology staff and facilities and are openly admitting they are preparing to receive an alien visitor. What on earth is all that about? We'll touch on that. But after going through some of this background, it'll, it'll be light and fast, so I hope I won't uh, bore you too much on some of that. But what are the, the uh, you know, we always need to answer the, the so what question. So what's that got to do with me? And we'll try to deal with what do these challenges mean to you personally? And so that's where we're headed. A little bit about transhumanism. I, there are four technologies you need to be aware of. 
And one of them, of course, is genetics and microbiology. I assume in this audience, I don't have to elaborate on that. You're familiar with the incredible discoveries that are continuing to be made every day in that whole field. But there's another technology, you may not follow too closely, but it's worth following very closely, and that's another field of study called robotics. And we're also going to talk a little bit about nanotechnologies and what are these things. And finally, of course, the area of artificial intelligence. And uh, so we'll talk about their aspirations, and that will startle you, and, their, and uh, what their priorities are, and that may surprise you, and we'll talk about its dangers. So that's the core of what we're going to talk about. We'll go on some other things, too. Tampering with the engines of creation. You and I are on a journey between the myths of yesterday and the realities of tomorrow. Many of us are victims of myths of the past, and uh, we're having to unscramble the uh, realities of tomorrow. Now, I won't spend a lot of time on the island of Moreau, but you may recall uh, H.G. Wells published a science fiction novel how about this island where this doctor had combined different beasts into other creatures and so forth. And it warns of the, 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 in the novel the dangers of unchecked and irresponsible scientific research. And what's interesting about the novel, that's unfolding as we speak for many reasons. These animal hybrids that H.G. Wells in his uh, uh, model mentioned were called chimeras. A myth that was a mythical Greek uh, creature with a lion's beard, a goat's body, and a serpent's tail. And uh, scientists today have created sheep that possess human hearts and livers, just to mention a few. Pigs that have been born with human blood. Did you know that? How many knew that? See, that's something that's not widely known, but is much heralded by many. And uh, are they altering the genetic makeup of an animal kingdom? Is that opening up a Pandora's box? Is that going to open the door to diseases we never heard of? And uh, so forth. That's how we can be so terrified by the bird flu among the humans. Why? You, you'll discover that these things are cross, they're creating things we didn't expect. Scientists at the Salk Institute in San Diego recently engineered a mice that possess a small percentage of human cells. I think I hired one of those once. No, I don't. So they injected embryonic st uh, human stem cells into the brains of rodent fetuses, resulting in birth of mice with both human and rodent brain cells. You know, you think you may have met some of them. I don't know the feeling. And one of the goals of this research is very noteworthy. They're trying to make realistic models of neurologic disorders that may prove useful in, in, in studying other diseases. They all have good, good goals. Irving Weissman of the Stanford University and his team injected human neural stem, uh, stem cells into mouse fetuses, and that helped make the first mouth with a nearly complete human immune system. So these things are worthy of study. There's, 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 there's worthwhile uh, potential benefit here. And so uh, the percentage of brain cells in the existing mice is only about 1%, but he thinks that they can make them the almost entirely equivalent human cells as they go forward. So, now, the problems in these areas, while there's noble goals, there are few safeguards against errors or even open abuse. And of course, there are cross-species implications that haven't, there's no way to, to anticipate. And they actually have mice that they're, they're growing human organs on in the hopes of actually putting them to practical use. And if that picture doesn't bother you, you haven't looked at it carefully enough. Okay. okay. Unknown diseases or complications. Tampering with the human genome is part of the thing that's going on here. We're talking about genetically engineered ath uh, you know, athletes. That's a, that's a major topic. And uh, scientists at John Hopkins, John Hopkins University discovered a gene in mice which controls growth, the GDF8, and uh, the uh, growth differenti differentiation factor, they call it. And uh, so, they yielded super mice three times larger and much stronger than the normal ones. This was back in uh, Nature magazine. And the, uh, there's a, it, in this field, the, many of these slides are, are quickly eclipsed by things that are happening each week. So I won't spend a lot of time on these, but there were mice that grew 15 to 30 percent larger than normal. And, uh, even, and, and even there's, there's potential fruit from this, but there's also dangers. That's really the main point I want to get across here as we go. And, <clears throat> there are also potential self-replicating mutations. 
and they're all impossible to fully, you can't anticipate the mutations. So while they may have experiments that have a certain goal, what really derives from this is hard to get to gain. And the other problem is these are not done in well-organized laboratories, government laboratories or university. There are many, many of the technologies here are done in garages, basements. There's no regulatory procedural disciplines. So this is an uncontrolled environment. And uh, there are many small, intensely competitive laboratories chasing these things and uh, very few government or established labs that are uh, uh, the main ones here. Now, uh, the think tanks back in Europe as well as here point out the free access to genetic sequence data for human genome and large number of other genomes, including pathogenic microorganisms, could pose a significant threat if misused. No kidding. That's pretty self-evident. And uh, these are all from the international space research back some years ago and a terrorist might develop a pathogen that could target a specific ethnic group. See, as we control, as we understand the genome, you can start creating diseases that can target specifics. And that's pretty spooky. Well, there's also this whole area of robot weapons that you're, you may be hearing a lot about. I wanted to get a couple of them that I thought were interesting because they're predicted in the Bible, whether you realize it or not. In Jeremiah 50, verse 9, there's a verse and I'm not going to concern ourselves here with the context, but just one phrase that's in it. Jeremiah records, For lo, I will raise and cause up to come up against Babylon, the assembly of great nations from the north country, and they shall set themselves in array against her. And from thence shall she be taken. Get this. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man, and none shall return in vain. Now, in the English, you don't pick it up, but in the Hebrew, it's very emphatic. It actually, as of a mighty expert, the expertise is not in the shooter, it's in the arrow. Did you pick up on that? The verb is sakal in the Hebrew. It means to be prudent, circumspect, wisely understand, and prosper. That's a characteristic of the arrow, not the shooter. It's a fill participle masculine singular absolute. It means to have insight, to give attention to, Consider, ponder, be prudent, to have comp In other words, the arrow has comprehension. Do you see what it's saying? Now, what, can you give me some examples of that? Yes, I can. Uh, and by the way, the ISV says the arrows will, shall be like a skilled warrior. They won't miss their targets. The NAS, the arrows will be like an expert warrior. So there, it, this is not a contrived uh, translation. The intelligence is in the arrow, and they can't miss. In other words, these are smart weapons. They're mentioned in the Bible. We, today we take them for granted, but I wanted to put a big biblical root to that. The, word, the arrow is katis. It's anything shot from an engine of war, shot by a bow. In 1611, when the King James, that was obviously a bow and arrow. But the same word be, could be used for a missile or anything thrown as an arrow or a, a javelin. And in that sense, I'll get through some of this here. Well, that's exciting. I hear strange noises, but not, that's not changing, is it? Oh boy. What do we do here? Huh? It won't, it won't, uh, well, let's see if I can do this another way. No, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, that's just a repeat of that slide, but I think we're going in the right direction here. And I'm going to have to do this manually, maybe. Okay. These are examples of arrows that have intelligence. And these are all, there's another thing. There's a rifle, by the way, that you may want to l l know about. Uh, the XM25. I don't know if that's familiar. It's kind of an interesting device. It's coming to a war near you. Um, it has a system of range about 2,300 feet. And I believe they're using it in Afghanistan. But the, the gun, it has a gun sight with, that uses a laser um, that measures the distance. And it also sets a time on the bullet to explode. So you can shoot over the guys. If he's behind a barrier, you can shoot over the barrier and nail him. And uh, so it's a, it's a bullet that has the effect of going around corners. It's a game changer. And uh, they'll be able to use this to target snipers hidden in trenches rather than calling airstrikes. And uh, so it has a train, whoops, well, we don't have to dwell time on this. I'm having trouble with this, uh, the other thing. So the, the, uh, it's, it's a game changer, basically. And uh, 
all the soldier has to do is uh, the, the thing would add a, add a meter using a button on his trigger, and when fired, the explosive round would carry exactly one meter past the wall before it explodes in the, in the nature of a hand, hand grenade. Let's get back to the transhumanism more directly. Direct human extension, supplementing the human anatomy. Um, the FDA has approved a telescopic bionic eye implant, by the way. This is the beginning of it. It's a, it involves re removing the lens of the eye completely and replacing it with a now FDA approved implant capable of magnifying two, almost two to three times. And uh, the specific thing isn't that important, except it's, it shows you a direction they're going. They're able to do things that are not just replacement for something you lost, but something that might have function, functionality that goes beyond what you had. We're going to look at a few of those, if I can get this thing to... This is very strange. Okay, well, I'll go at it manually here if I can. Okay. In, in robotics, they don't use gears and hydraulics anymore. They actually use muscles. They have a, a, mus a bionic muscle is 100 times stronger than yours, and they're made out of elastic metal called the shape of memory wire, and they're chemically powered with alcohol. Don't jump to conclusions, but we'll go. Um, and the, the, these artificial muscles are, 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 of course, funded by the military, as you can imagine. And so uh, let's just keep moving on here this, while it's working here. Um, there's machine emplacements, of course, and the thing that impedes robotics is skin. Well, it's in, uh, one of the things they're trying to do is get direct limb to brain communication with these things. And robotic limbs have limited motions and the user can't feel what he or she is touching. A new approach using optical fibers implanted around the nerves can transmit more data and let the prosthetics speak to the brain. Scientists have discovered they can stimulate a neuron to send a message by shining infrared light on it. And so DARPA, the Advanced Research Projects Agency of the Department of Defense, is awarding contracts to explore these kinds of things further. The direct brain to computer interface, interfacing, people are actually connecting these devices to their brain. And uh, a monkey here is operating a uh, robotic arm with direct brain to computer interfacing. And uh, it's responding to his thought patterns. They can quickly learn to control voluntarily. They can control the firing rates of individual multiple neurons in the primary motor cortex if rewarded properly and so on. And I won't get into those details. The main point is the, the thing that's held robotics back is a, a replacement for skin. And they now have found a way to make synthetic skin that is so sensitive it can feel the footprint of a fly which means the robot can be designed to tell what it's picking up. Is it a wine glass? Is it a bowling ball? Is it a piece of silk? It can tell. And so the synthetics, that, that's been a major breakthrough in the robotics area. And I won't get into There's two different ways they can do that. I won't take the time to spend our time on that. The other field, I, the, I want to go through four fields. We've talked about the genetics. We've talked about robotics briefly. There's a field called nanotechnology that I want you to be aware of. That involves the manufacture and manipulation of materials at the molecular level in the atom, the smallest things you can get. And uh, uh, here, uh, uh, to give you a feeling of a nanometer, it takes about 100,000 nanometers is a piece of paper. So nanometers are very, very small. So you're talking about molecular size, molecular size machines. And they can develop drugs. And th For example, it can go and find a place in your body and deliver a micro dose, if you will, that would have an intensity 10,000 to 1 you could do any other way. So they're, they're, they have tremendous potential. And uh, our skills at developing nanomaterials, of course, is going so fast that uh, there are, it's hard to even keep up with any one of these. But the big one, the fourth one of the ones I want to summarize here is artificial intelligence. And that's the blurring the distinctions between the man and the machine. And uh, there are ways now that they're, it's getting fuzzier and fuzzier as to which is which. They, it, uh, the, uh, the first step towards computer mind reading has come from using brain scans to identify thoughts, and they're doing this at Princeton University's Neuroscience Institute. And these brain scans have, dis, there's patterns that they can, they're starting to study. What's exciting about this too is it's non-invasive. They don't have to directly connect to the brain. They can re read the brains through, uh, through uh, other devices. I'll show you here in a minute. 
And uh, the basic idea is to try to determine what's on the subject's mind and see what they can infer from the brain scans directly. And uh, so they can, they're looking at the pattern studying that. And uh, so there's, there's a lot of optimism. We'll come back to that here too. There's actually a television set being marketed in China by uh, Hire in which you change channels by thinking about them. And uh, the, the way this works is you get, uh, uh, or change the volume, whatever. What you do is you wear a mindset. Now this, by the way, is a retail device. They're sold on the, the, for a couple hundred dollars, primarily for university use, um, but uh, they will measure the, and, and report non-invasively the brain waves, and they gives you, they're primarily used for games and such, but uh, hires using it to, to try to be able to control your television set. I think most of you realize the toughest thing to control on the television is the off switch, off switch but we'll move on here. But the, uh, this mind reader headset is a, what startled me is it's a retail device. And uh, if you're interested, you can, you can track it down on the internet for a couple hundred dollars, you can buy one and figure out something to do with it then. But uh, the Army, though, has a mind control project where they're trying to develop thought helmets that would harness silent brain waves for secure communication among troops. And that's not, they actually, those are contracts that are being led. They hope it'll lead to direct mental control of military systems by thought alone. And, uh, and they're, they're, they're a long way from getting there, but they're letting research contracts in that direction. And so a five-year contract's been awarded to a coalition of scientists, both at University of California at Irvine, Carnegie Mellon, and University of Maryland, to try to decode the activity in those brain, uh, and it, so the soldier could, radio commands to one or more uh, comrades by thinking of the message he wants them to get. But perhaps the most dangerous of all these things are the brain-to-computer interfaces, or BCIs they call them. And uh, they, they're actually implanted inside the skull, and, and, but rest outside the brain rather than within the grain matter. And uh, this, what, what most people that are in this field are, this thing is acting strange here. Let me get, kill that. Is that on there too? Yeah. Um, when these professors connect themselves to computers or other devices, they are typically PhD, and, and, and PhDs are very, very um, trained in a specificity, a specific area. But there's something that goes along with a PhD, and that's pride. And uh, one of the things that startles me is to realize that these people and I traf I've trafficked with many of them in government labs and elsewhere, um, have usually zero insight theologically. They have no grasp of the field of study called demonology, and in a field within which there are things called entries, measure ways that demons can gain access. And when you open up communication channels, those are two-way channels. So the kinds of things that are possible, I'm not saying they're prevalent at the moment, but are possible, are really quite disturbing. Um, but anyway, the, these, the, 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 the best resolution if you're gonna do this kind of study is direct connection and people are doing things like that. Um, let's shift a little more to the computer side of it. IBM has unveiled experimental computer chips designed for a new generation of brain-inspired computers that learn from what's going on. And I'm, not, I'm talking about the hardware itself does. Cognitive computing aims to use information from many different inputs. So it's, it's multiple input and it's self-programming, if you will. And uh, these uh, chips would allow a sensor studded gl glove to monitor sight, smells, textures, temperature of grocery products, whatever. There's all kinds of commercial potential here. But they'll also uh, uh, integrate messages in ways that may be far more intuitive than we normally think of in terms of software alone. And I won't get into the, the specifications, of it because any specification I put in a slide is out of date a week later, so we'll just keep moving here. Um, but there is, there is a, uh, there is a um, um, comment here that deserves, uh, needs to be made. There is a point, Ray Kurzweil, one of the gurus in this world, um, looks for a crossover he gives it an unfortunate name. He borrows a term from mathematics called a singularity. 
he calls it the singularity. It's an unfortunate term because it's misleading, but what he means by that is there's a point at which the com computers will exceed the capacity of the human brain. And that's only a, a few years away, not a few decades, a few years away. It's that close. And when that happens, that's a major, major milestone in the field of artificial intelligence, obviously. And uh, we'll talk more about that. But the computers that learn, um, they're already taking these into applications of pattern recognition, navigation, other areas. And I, won't, I don't want to get into the details of this one. There are a new, there's a new a partnership between IBM and 3M where they're looking towards a new breed of microprocessors where they stack 100 layers of chips atop one another to, to make it thinner. You make things thinner for lots of reasons. Speed is part of it. When you're operating at those speeds, uh, even a, a few inches can be in, uh, too big an encumbrance. And so they're trying to, 3M's trying to create an adhesive that will allow this to happen. It's also, there's a heat dissipation issue and the rest of it. But these, this is also expecting to give you a thousand to one advantage. And this thing still isn't, okay, we'll just do it manually here. Okay. So I want to get into the, art in, the, the, the artificial intelligence area. The power of computers obviously are continuing to accelerate. Their size, their energy and costs are diminishing. And the, the facility of the hardware con continues to accelerate. Both the hardware and the software are making gigantic leaps week by week as we go. And the singularity I tried to explain, that's a term that is associated with Ray Kurzweil. But uh, that's when the, when the computational intelligence exceeds that of the human mind. That's the target. Now you say, well, what's wrong with that? You have to understand what their admitted ultimate goal is. Because if you can take your intelligence and transfer it into that environment, you've achieved immortality. It's a path to immortality and to exchange consciousness between bodies, uh, synthetic or otherwise. And the fact that this could, could at least conceivably lead to a path of, toward immortality can give you a glimpse of what kind of theology these people share, or lack thereof, if you will. Ray Kurzweil's concept of this, this, this consciousness, not, can it, not only will it be able to be translated into a machine, you can combine consciousness. If you collectivize the consciousness, at the end of a very long, of a documentary on his life, they ask him, do you believe there's a God? And his answer is very simple. He says, not yet. That's really the goal that they think they're on. Now, see, the real problem is the real you See, I can't see you. I'm standing up on stage. I can see the package you are in, you see. The real you, call it soul, spirit, conscience, whatever, it, you are temporary resident in a disposable hardware environment. Why shouldn't it be transferable to an alternate, perhaps advantageous environment, even a machine-enhanced environment? The day will be coming when they can create an environment that may be more hospitable than your own body, at least in their mind. So that would, what would limit a continuing path to subsequent upgrades? I'm ready for an upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> I don't plan to look to them for that upgrade, by the way. Let me hasten to add that. So there's some coming nightmares coming. The real behind the scenes, something we have, I haven't focused on, but I want to before we're through, is talk about super soldiers armed with ultimate weapons. There is an arms race going on. It's very hidden, but very real between all the development countries. China, Russia, and the US, probably places in Europe, are going in this direction in the hopes of being able to field the super soldier. That could be a game changer in the, in the pattern of nations. Networked super soldiers with unlimited mind controls, can you imagine? Unenforced lawlessness among a privileged few is part of the scenario here. Consciousness exchanges offering a form of immortality. Collective consciousness ushering in a utopian collective or the ultimate nightmare. That's what's on the horizon. This is not decades away. These are just a matter of years in the, in the minds of the practitioners. So we have convergent technology. We've got nanotechnologies whose goal is molecule-sized machines. We have robotics, which are aimed at being self-modifying sentient machines. That's their goal, and they're working on it. 
and those two technologies, you know, grease each other. There's genetics, of course, whose goal is the self-replication of manipulated entities. And then you have, thus from that, you'll get directable diseases targeting specific groups, maybe even individuals. There's no reason they can't design a disease that would only affect your DNA. Mail you a letter, be careful who said it, yeah? And of course, artificial intelligence, exceeding the human mind, the singularity of will. These are convergent technologies. The composite goal, self-replicating sentient machines, superior, perhaps overwhelming, combatant strengths, transfer of conscious between and to extension bodies, a path towards immortality, a lure, of course, towards global tyranny. These things constitute a lure towards global tyranny. Can you imagine those technologies if they were in the hands of some people we know of the past? Can you imagine what they would have done? Now, something else you should know, there is a group called the Jasons. It's an independent group of scientists which advises the United States government on matters of science and technology. And it was, they were created as a way to have a younger generation of scientists to replace the uh, uh, Los Alamos and MIT Radiation Laboratory alumni. And, uh, uh, for administrative purposes, they're, they're administered through the MITRE Corporation. But the point is, uh, they, the, the, they, their, their sponsors include the Department of Defense, of course, and the uh, Navy and, and uh, Department of Energy and the U.S. intelligence community. Most of the Jason reports are classified. They all have security clearances. They include physicists, biologists, chemists, all kinds of fields, by the way. And they're selected because of their scientific brilliance. And over the years, they've included 11 Nobel Prize laureates and several dozen members of the United States National Academy of Sciences. And uh, classified transhuman projects are the dominant topic of the contracts that they are getting. We can't get the contracts. They're classified. But we can find out a lot about them. So. See if I can get this to change. Good, yeah. And I won't go through the list. You can skim through quickly on here the, the flavor of the kinds of contracts that are being, that are accelerating our progress in what they collectively call transhumanism. And uh, now we have a highly classified priority agenda that drives wide, a widespread global arms race that will eclipse all others. And so this is, this is leading what we call the age, what's leading to is the age of hybrids. And there's another kind of hybrid I want to talk about before we're through, but uh, we've talked about the Rasputin and the dangers. Okay, what are the dangers here? I'll highlight them so far. Uh, let, uh, let's back up here a second here. One of the dangers of all of this is it ignores what I call the metacosm. And for this and almost everything else that we publish in our materials, you may want to understand what that term means. There are boundaries to the reality, to our physical reality. Those are well known today, by the way. I don't want to touch on that. I'm going to use the symbol of uh, da Vinci's Vitruvian Man as a representation of the reach of man. Okay, that just rep that represents you and me. And if I and I'm going to let on the diagram up there, let size increase to the right. Bigness is the right, smallness to the left. Okay. Now, as we look towards things that are larger than ourselves, we'll call that collectively the macrocosm. And that plunges you into the study of astronomy and astrophysics and topics like that. The great, much we, could, we have whole presentations on each of these topics, but the main sum, thing here is 20th century science, the great discovery of 20th century science is that the universe is finite. It's not infinite. It may be expanding, but it's finite. And that's both thermographically and other reasons uh, demonstrable. So the macrocosm, there's a limit to the size of the universe. And because there is, that's what gives rise to these speculations called the Big Bang and whatever. We know it had a beginning, and we know that it'll ultimately have an end. But let's move on from that. Let's go the other way. Let's look at smallness. And now we'll call that the microcosm. When you get into this world, it gets weirder than any of the others. It leads with quantum physics and subatomic particles. And whether you're talking about length, mass, energy, or time, you discover that everything in small has a limit to how small it can be. 
See, you and I would think that if I took a piece of string, I'd cut it in half, no problem. I'd take the half, I, I could cut it in half. And you would think that conceptually, at least, I could do that for, it might get too small to literally do, but your thinking is, whatever I've got left, I can cut in half. That turns out to be true. It turns out when you get to 10 to minus 33 centimeters, that's very small, and try to cut that in half, it loses a very peculiar property. It loses a thing called locality. It has what they call non-locality. We now, and it's been proven in the laboratory, that every photon in the universe knows exactly what every other photon in the universe is doing in a certain sense. That there's a, a concept of non-locality that's philosophically shattering. But the main point is there is a limit to smallness. Now I want you to understand the implications of this. You and I are in an environment that turns out to be a virtual simulation that's a digital simulation. And uh, uh, now, that's not my conclusion. If you get Scientific American, June of 2005, there's an article there that highlights this sort of thing. The scientists are disturbed because they're discovering that some of the constants of physics are changing. And it's very hard to prove, and they're working very hard at that, but it's turning out they are. And what the article points out that if the constants of physics are changing, that implies that our reality is a shadow of a larger reality. That's their words, not mine. And when I saw that, I just jumped for joy because that's exactly what the Bible has been saying all along. Is that uh, we, uh, uh, well, let's see, I think I go, go a little further. Whoops. No, I think I've spared you a diversion here. There is, uh, the, the ancient Hebrew sages, Nachmanides, from his, from the, uh, from his uh, study of the book of Genesis, concluded that the universe has 10 dimensions, only four are knowable, six are not knowable. That's in his writings in the 13th century. We've spent hundreds of millions of dollars creating atomic accelerators, which have now revealed to us that the universe has apparently 10 dimensions. Four are directly discernible, Six we know are there but can't get at. There's curl less than 10 to the minus 35 centimeters. So we've spent all that money what, discovering what Nachmanides learned by just studying the Hebrew text of the book of Genesis. And I'm not being facetious, I'm being quite serious. And uh, so we live in a, in a simulation that's limited to four direct dimensions we can experience. And by the way, not only is what the Bible says, it lists them in Ephesians chapter three, verse 18, our four dimensions that we have. So it's no surprise to Paul, if you will. But we now also have knowledge that there's six other dimensions that we can't get at directly. Now we can glibly call that the spiritual world or something, and we're going to, uh, more, more consistently, is to, this physical reality we're in is embedded in something larger, which we we'll call the metacosm. And uh, that's the domain when you start studying angels. We have a whole background around that one. And that's what we think, what we suspect, don't know, we suspect is the domain of the UFOs. Because we now know they're transdimensional. Not tra they're not intergalactical, they're transdimensional. And I'll get to that in a little bit here, I think. Our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. Scientific American, June of 2005. But let's uh, finish up the transhumanism. That see, the problem with transhumanism, it ignores the metacosm. People traffic, the, and, and the, the that's a, a supernatural, that's a, their supernatural warfare where you and I are both the puppets and the prizes. That's what's going on. The transhumanists are totally oblivious to that. They have no grasp of that. When you open up a communication channel in our software, we might call it soul, spirit, whatever, it yields access permission that is not reversible. For those of you that saw The Exorcist, that, that, that was, William Blatty's novel was based on case study. And what started that whole nightmare was a gal playing, it, wasn't, it was a guy, not a gal, but that's the point. Um, the, the, it was based on case studies. Um, fooling around with the Ouija board, which is an entry. And uh, some of these video games and so forth are potentially uh, uh, entries. Let's take a look at the scripture here a little bit. We're all familiar with Nebuchadnezzar's uh, dream of Daniel 2 and also Daniel 7, this different set of idioms, but same subject really. And we all know about the four empire, gold, the, the gold, silver, brass, and iron, and the Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, we, we've all been there. But when you get to verse 43 of Daniel 2, where Daniel is explaining all this to Nebuchadnezzar, 
he, he gets to this peculiar stuff called the iron mixed with clay. Everybody remembers the iron, legs are iron and the feet were iron mixed with clay. Verse 43 says, Whereas thou sawest, speaking to, this is Daniel explaining to Nebuchadnezzar, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, he switches to a personal pronoun, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. What's he talking about? No one should know. Nobody knows. I tell you, we, can t we do know. That means that them, they, whoever they are, have to be something other than the seed of men, or they can't mingle. In other words, the grammar requires them to be two separate, non-mixable groups. So what are they? We don't know. And uh, the, they, the personal pronoun is relevant here. And I want you to notice then that the seed of men, they're not the seed of men. They're not mankind. Are they hybrids? Possible. Are they somehow not, see, they're not the seed of men, they're the seed of something else. Are they Nephilim? Could be. Or maybe something even more sinister. Are they aliens of, of some other kind? That's what's so provocative that the two guys who wrote a book a year ago and, and published in April of 2012 that predicted the abdication of the Pope, which hadn't, hadn't, hadn't happened for 600 years, and then we, we, and 11 months later, in February of 2013, the Pope advocates those two guys, Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, made the front pages. Well, they've just published another book in April of 2013 which, which reveals the fact that Vatican is su committing substantial resources as they prepare to receive what they believe will be an alien visitor of some kind. What on earth is going on? We need to remember that in the scripture, it's not, the Antichrist isn't a guy, it's a duet. There's two people there involved, the false prophet and the other one. Um, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth who had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. And see, the second beast is from the earth, and so forth. Um, some people think he's a Jew because, the, because of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Greek trans, uh, allusion of this in John 5.43 is allos, not heteros, and that implies he's Jewish. That's, that's not conclusive in my mind, but that's when some of the beliefs come about. And he appar but he apparently is received by Israel, among other things, from Psalm 55 and others. But he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. He caused the earth, and he's the one that caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And, uh, and he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, really. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast and which had the wound by the sword and to live. You see the identities are consistent through there. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast, really. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the beast should be killed. Interesting stuff. He gave life to the image of the beast and so on. Okay. And he caused both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive the mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell, or save that he had a mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And, uh, and there's been a lot of discussion about this. Uh, this mark, by the way, is prohibited all through the Torah and elsewhere. But uh, whose numbers? Everybody gets confused about this. You, you hear you, articles about insertable chips and nanopower when I was on their board, all that kind of talk, RFID chips, barcodes. Uh, for implementation. They missed the point. It's not our number that's the issue, it's his number that's at issue. And uh, it's his name that is you know, the crucial identity aspects, not, not the uh, participants here. And uh, so, and there's a whole study on that you can get into if you like, but uh, most of what's written is, is, is missed the point. But the thing I really want you, before you get too disturbed about transhumanism, I want to go the other way and talk about God Places when he limits boundaries and uh, the limits to human arrogance. He, God does put a line in the sand. Uh, back in Genesis 11, I want you to remember that chapter. The whole earth at that time was one language and one speech. And it came past as they journeyed from the east. They found a plain on the land of Shinar and uh, they dwelt there. And uh, the, the plain of Shinar is where Babylon emerges, of course. 
And they said one to another, go and let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they only had for mortar. They said, go, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name that, that, that lest we be scattered upon the face of the earth. And uh, so that you all know about the Tower of Babel. But I want you to notice the Lord, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, behold, the people is one. And they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. See, the unpardonable sin, to use that phrase, not to make that identity, but the thing that God would not allow is giving them the freedom to do anything they could imagine to do. There's a point at which they draw the line. And by the way, who's he talking to here? It's a conversation within the Trinity, analogous, if you will, to Psalm 2, where all three of them are having a discussion. Check it out if you haven't done that before. God says, go to, let us, plural, plural us, by the way. By the way, did you know in Hebrew how many it takes to make a plural? In English, it's two. In Hebrew, it's three. I thought that's kind of interesting. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the thence on the face of the earth. And they left off to build a city. So let us go down. I think that's fun. And let's go to the bidding of Babel and all that. Okay, um, let's shift here. We've talked a little bit about this. Um, oh boy. Well, let me skip right to it here. I think I've touched on these enough. The ultimate enigma that you unveiled, the interval between the miracle of our origin and the mystery of our destiny. That's our challenge continually. But I, I made an allusion earlier that I want to double back on here. I, want, I said I couldn't see you, that you're in, tempor you're in temporary hardware. There's an analogy I want to draw between computers and ourselves. We all know that computer has hardware, microcircuits, memory, wires, whatever. And uh, there's also software. Uh, there's a user interface, there's internal interfaces, there's machine language, what have you. If you knew everything there is to know about every wire, every resistor, every piece of hardware that's in my computer, could you tell me anything about its behavior? And the answer is no, not really, because it's simply a residence for software, right? And I want to draw that analogy, you see. Um, the software are, are other things, but that's fine. I, I always like to use this slide. Um, the slide represents the hardware of man. It's very simple as a switch that's, that's on and off, right? Whoops, did I, did it, oh, it switched for me, huh? Okay. Uh, did, I, did I get it right? You got the complicated, I didn't see it here. It went too fast for me here. Okay, good, we'll leave that alone. Okay. But to be serious a little bit, there is a parallel between the hardware and our physical body and software and our actual self. The real you, whether set the vocabulary aside, whether it's soul, spirit, mind, your thoughts, whatever, that collectively is software, not hardware. And the, the thing I want to get across is software is not material. Software is information. It has no mass in and of itself. A light switch weighs the same whether the switch is on or off. The one or zero is, it, it has no... And can I see if I get going here? Now, the, if I take a, a uh, memory device, I'm using a diskette here, that's blank, okay, and I put that on a postal scale, it has nothing on it, it will weigh about seven tenths of an ounce. I can spend hundreds of dollars and load it with millions of bytes of software, and what will it weigh? Okay, well, if I add that all up, it still will weigh seven-tenths of an ounce. In other words, there's no change. The software has no mass. Are you with me? Okay, I can even take software and send it through the airwaves, can I? Right? See, the implication of that is time is a property of mass, with mass. If it has no mass, it has no time dimension to it. Okay? Now, that's the physics of software. It has no mass. See, the weight of a storage device is not impacted by the presence of the software. It can even be sent through the airwaves. It's all software is not constrained by time. 
Time is a physical property that varies with mass acceleration and gravity, among other things. See, your destiny is eternal, whether you are saved or not. The real you is software, not hardware. I can't see you. I can only see the package you happen to be in at the moment. Software has no mass. Now, my package has a little too much mass, but it has nothing to do with my software. OK. Now, you are temporarily resident in a package, in a disposable hardware environment. The real you has no mass. Your temporary container may have too much mass, but uh, the real you requires no time to mention. You are eternal whether you are saved or not. That'll disturb a lot of theologians here. The issue is not your eternity. The issue is where are you going to spend it? And Walter Martin used to point out there's two paths to God to heaven. One path is that you never make a mistake from the time you're born on. You never sin. You never, you never fumble. You, you never, you absolutely you have no sin at all. You go through your whole life without sin. And then when you get to the pearly gates, you tell God, move over. There's now there's two of us. And of course, he was being facetious, as was his style, just to get a point across. No, we're not perfect. But the good news is God himself, knowing that, entered his creation and paid our price for us. You know all that here. So if you're, per if you're perfect, there's no problem. But it's time for all of us, I'm going to suggest, is to, change our, to renew our citizenship. And uh, one of the most difficult things people ask me, you know, what, you know, what's happening to America? Boy, I don't know. There's a whole other topic we could explore, and that is the encroaching darkness and the fact that all the things that made our country great up through the 40s, 50s, 60s maybe is gone. We do not have a constitutional government. We do not have freedom of speech. We do not have a Bill of Rights. And that's all been, what's amazing isn't that it's happened. What's amazing is that nobody cares. Nobody notices the apathy, partly because the entire middle class has gone on the take too. They've also got the cancer of entitlement mentalities. So there's a lot going on. So we could talk a lot about the coming scenario, the, the Psalm 80, I'm, I'm dropping a few thoughts here, so we'll get some questions, but Psalm 83, I think, is a pr prelude to Ezekiel 38. An anticipated world leader will, will be exploiting a global crisis. And uh, there will be roles, I believe, this is just personal suspicion, involving what apparently are alien encounters and creatures beyond our imagining. And that will climax in an actual Armageddon, of course. And your challenge. I, put, I always like to close with a challenge on the screen, which if you accept what I put on the screen, you flunk the course. I'm going to put something on the screen in sincerity, but I want you to challenge it, because it's ridiculous. I believe that you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in human history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. That's preposterous. Challenge it. Don't accept it, for heaven's sakes. But how do you challenge that statement? You've got to do two things to do that. Two basic challenges. First of all, you've got to find out what the Bible really says. Not what Gina or Chuck or somebody else. It's too important to delegate. You need to find out what the Bible itself actually says. And the good news is it's never been more available in the, in the history of man. In our environment today, the Word of God is more available than it's ever been in the history of man. You do not have to know Hebrew and Greek to examine the Hebrew and Greek of the original texts. There's software that'll do it for you. You can put your kick ear on any word, it'll tell you what the original word said as parts of speech and more than you really want to know about it. And that software is free of charge, available on the internet and many other ways. We are without excuse. And the information appliances we travel with, absolutely astonishing. Many of us carry six Bibles in our phone. You've got to be kidding. And the internet. Here's the other point. All of man's knowledge is a couple of clicks away on the internet. On any subject you can articulate, the availability of information on anything is astonishing. We are indeed without excuse. But the second thing you've got to do, that's not enough. You've got to find out what's really going on. You've got to answer the rhetorical question that Pilate threw into the pot. What is truth? 
You need to find out. Now, you have a real disadvantage there because we live in a culture that has decided there is no truth. Science used to be the quest for truth. There's a difference between science and technology. Technology produces products. It validates itself with products. Science is a priesthood. If you don't, know the, if you don't have the right creed, you are executed from a career. Science is a priesthood. It's not, connect, it's not a, a, a quest for truth. And furthermore, we now find ourselves in the age of deceit. You can't believe anything the papers say you. I love what Warren Worsby says, uh, anyone that believes that an, an airport announcement would believe anything. <laughs> no, we, uh, our papers, our news services, the good news is the internet's an end run on those. Not that everything on the internet's true, of course not. But there are reliable sources of information on the internet. You need to uh, search them out and check them out and, and take advantage of that. But the other thing that's happening, and I think that's really the ex if people that want to start talking about UFOs and the Vatican's accepting a visitor, the experts will generally agree that what we're dealing with here is a very well-orchestrated cosmic delusion. There is a specific delusion that's going to be sprung that if it were possible, it will deceive the very elect, Jesus said. And, Paul, and even Paul talks about it as being given over to the lie, not just a lie, not just, no, no, a specific lie. I don't know what it is, but I suspect that it's somehow going to involve all these things. The world is going to change dramat dramatically. The good news is many of the things that we know are on the agenda happen right after the Harpazo. The next event is none of the things we talked about. The next event in the scenario will be the Harpazo, which I personally suspect is deliberately indeterminate in order to catch Satan by surprise. I think that was God's strategy from the beginning. And so the good news is I would like anyone keeping records here to notice for the first time in the history of Chuck Missler, I think I finished on